Uh, greetings in the name of Jesus. Uh, I'm uh, Pastor Kane Gary uh, at New Life Christian Center in Norfolk, Virginia. Uh, New Life Christian Center. We're thankful uh, for you tuning in right now. And uh, we just finished our uh, worship service. We're going to uh, break the word of God. I want to encourage you, um, you know, to uh, share this video with, um, you know, some friends. And uh, it should be a good word. Hallelujah. He is risen. He is risen indeed. I said he is risen. He is risen indeed. Listen, we need to keep that alive. Last week, man, was Easter Sunday. We're all excited, you know, about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. He's not in the tomb, but what? He is alive. Amen. Amen. Is he alive in you today? Yes. How do you know he's alive in you today? Boy, it got quiet in here. How do you know? How do you know? He's alive. Yeah, and everybody should be able to say that it wasn't a trick question because, man, there's a fire that's inside me, that there's something in me that is greater than who I am, that greater is he in me than he in the world, that I am more than a conqueror in him, not by my own strength. Hallelujah. But we start to recognize who Christ is within us. He's the hope of glory. We sang that song this morning, you know, let the glory of the Lord rise amongst us. Let the glory of the Lord, let it rise within us. Hallelujah. Come on. How many are going to let the glory of the Lord rise within us? Help me out this morning. I mean, that's the deal. That amen. You know, you just said, you know what that means? So let it be established in my life. That's what amen means. And when you say that, you're actually exciting the spirit of the God to come and do that work that you said amen to yes. within you. Come on, praise him, somebody. Yes. First Corinthians chapter 15, 1 through 11. Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel which I preach to you, which also you received in which you stand. How many of you are standing in the gospel today? Yes. You got to stand in the good news. One way to do that is you repeat the good news. You tell people that he is risen. You tell people that, you know, one way or the other, you let that light shine. We're standing in faith in that which Jesus has done on the cross. On the cross, his last words was, it is finished. In the Greek, that word is tetelestai. Yeah. Do you know what tetelestai means, really? It means paid in faith. Hallelujah. In the land back then, if you owed a bill and once you paid off that bill, they would stamp it, tetelestai, paid in full. When Jesus said it was finished, your sins were paid for in full. Come on, somebody say amen. amen. Now we got to walk in that, realizing that we're not under the condemnation of death and sin and the law, but we now have the gift of eternal life. But we got to tell people about that. There's people that don't have a clue. They might have mental assent, but they don't have life. They don't have life more abundantly. They just don't. You know how you can tell? You look at their face. They're worried. They're scared. They're, uh, you know, just all the rest. You know, they got mental problems, sleeping problems, all kind of problems. There's this peace of God that passes all understanding. But you've got to surrender to it. I'll tell you what. I've been through some tough things, and I know some people have been through even tougher things than I'll ever see. But you know what? They can go on. Why? Because the Prince of Peace, amen, rests in their heart. That doesn't mean you throw your hands up, you give up, and, you know, you're not active about the assignments that the Lord has given us. But what that means is you rest in Him. Come on, somebody say that. Amen. We get stirred up in our emotions. Why? Because the enemy constantly wants to remind us of the problems and what needs to be fixed and how are you going to do this and how are you going to get that done. And you got this. The next thing you know, you're under this higher weight of I want us and I gotta and I need it. You know what I'm saying. But what's important today? What is important today? It's the Lord's day. It's to worship in spirit and truth and that should be every day. Somebody yeah. say amen. Yeah. Listen, we've received the gospel by which you are saved. If you hold this, and somebody say if. Yeah. If you hold fast that word which I preached to you unless you believed in vain. Now, what's he talking about here? Unless you believed in vain. What is this word that I preach to you? Look at this. For I delivered to you, first of all, that which I also received, 
that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. In other words, he didn't have any other scriptures here. There wasn't any, you know, uh, when, he, when he's uh, teaching the first Corinthian church, he's teaching out of the Old Testament. 300, more than 300, 316 different uh, prophecies of the Old Testament were fulfilled in Jesus Christ. And Paul expositorily tells everybody, you know, using the Old Testament, this is important. Listen, we've been waiting for this Messiah. Some people are still waiting for the Messiah, but the Messiah's already come, already been here, already paid the price, that now we can have communion and fellowship with him. Somebody say amen. amen. And he was buried, listen, and he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Now that's important right there. You see, it's not just that he died for a sin, but he rose again. Somebody say he rose again. He rose, he rose again. He is risen. He's risen indeed. That's it, man. He is risen. Listen, that should reverberate within us. I know this is, you know, you, I'm just reminding you of stuff, and you already know all that. But you see, we got to keep alive the power of the resurrection. Yeah. As many of you have been baptized into Christ, amen, and been raised up in the power of the Holy Ghost. See, you know, you have to walk in that power, in that grace, that anointing, that gift of God. Has anybody here ever got a gift for Christmas or something? And you looked at it, oh, that's really nice. And you played with it for a little bit. Got tired of it. And then you put it in the closet and you ain't seen it in a while. Haven't taken it out. Yeah. You haven't looked at it, you know, but you were delighted in it when it happened. You see, there's a lot of us that had an experience with God and they just kind of either go to church or this and they stick the experience of what really happened on the shelf. Mm. You see, this salvation is to enjoy every day. This salvation, a free gift, it's, and it's, it's, it's something that should be esteemed highly. How many of you ever had an encounter with God where you know that you know that it was the Lord that touched you? How many of you know that? Wave a hand at me. See, you got to tell somebody about that. You got to keep your testimony alive. And it's not just at that salvation point, but you should have a testimony daily. I recognize, like that dream I told you about last night, that was the Lord. That was an encounter with God that touched me even in my sleep. Hallelujah. And it's still reverberating. It's working deep within me. And I know that I know that God is doing a wonderful work. There's no death or condemnation or guilt or shame in that which I told you about. But there's this hope. <laughs> there's this joy that God is in control. And I'm surrendering. I've surrendered to him. I'm going to let him finish the work. Amen. That's another message. Grace to finish the race. So we'll get there one day. But there is grace to finish the race well. Anybody can start off good. Hello. Yeah. You know, I, 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 I'm amazed at people that run marathons. I am amazed. I mean, the 26 mile ones or even a 5K. And, you know, they're going and some of them, you know, end up walking. But you know what? They finish. Yeah. They, they walk it out. They finish to do the best that you can. Some of you might have started out running really hard. And then all of a sudden you ran out of gas. Hallelujah. You need to get filled up again. Some of us have gotten out of shape. Hallelujah. Where we were able to do a whole lot spiritually, you know, exercising the gifts. And then all of a sudden we're somehow, you know, maybe not opportunity or whatnot, but we're not using that which God's given us. Amen. I know nobody here goes to the gym but me, but, you know, we exercise. And, you know, there's different seasons. You know, when you're a young man, you're trying to build muscles, get a physique, the ladies as well. And, uh, you know, we want to stay in shape, get the fat off us, you know, and all the rest. But as you get older, it comes to be like maintenance. You know what I'm saying? It's like, well, I'm never going to look like 30 years old again or 25 or whatever, but I want to be the best that I can be now for the Lord. Hallelujah. Amen. And so as you're, you're growing, is like just being a bodybuilder and eating right and all the rest. There's a spiritual diet that we must, you know, partake of on a regular basis. And a big part of that, believe it or not, is fellowship and communion with one another. And that's why church is so important. Studying the Bible is so important on a regular basis, not just by yourself, but I'll tell you what, one of the best moves of God I like 
is when there's four or five of us discussing the word of God, okay? And all of a sudden, I'm hearing the Holy Spirit through you guys, two and three, and bringing up things that, you know, that, man, I didn't think of that that way. I've never seen it that way. And you know, the Spirit of God is speaking. Not something we prepare to study, but by the Spirit, the Lord begins to teach. Come on, somebody. How many love that? Love that. It does, and it builds faith, and, and that's exciting. Now, I want to tell you this. In chapter 15, it talks about the different appearances of Jesus, okay? And this is important that, um, you know, and I heard Chuck Colson say this in his book, um, that I am totally convinced that Jesus rose from the dead because if it's a lie, it could not have been, you know, uh, Perpetrated, it couldn't have lasted this long. I says the early apostles, they were whipped, they were beaten, they were stoned, they were martyred, amen. They were crucified, they were beheaded, amen, for the cause of Christ. And, you know, they would not back off the resurrection. They would not, you know, renounce that. And you know how I know that? Because I was part of a conspiracy and we couldn't keep alive for one week. Do you hear what I'm saying? Yeah. They were, he was in a conspiracy to cover up with Nixon, right? About the water, uh, water yeah, break in. And he says, we couldn't keep the lie going for a week before people started drinking. You see, a lie is always going to have holes in it. Yeah. You ever wonder why you see these um, police stories and they say, tell me the story again. Tell it over. Why? They're looking. Are they going to say the same thing or are they opening up? You know, different avenues, you see. Yeah. A lie won't stand, but truth will stand forever. Amen. Come on, somebody. Yeah. You know, the Bible says you'll know the truth. What truth do you really got to know? That Jesus is alive today, sitting at the right hand of the Father, and he's here, alive in me by his Spirit. Yeah. Amen. And we need to learn how to recognize him when he's in the room. Hello? Ooh. We need to recognize when is God speaking? When is he talking? Hallelujah. And need to recognize when God's speaking to you, especially. He goes this, and he was buried and he rose again the third day, according to the scripture, verse 5, and that he was seen by Cephas, then the 12. Now, this is talking about Peter. Okay, Cephas, Peter. And I'm, I got a, a, a feeling by this scripture that Peter was one of the guys on the Emmaus Road. I have a feeling that he was one of the guys. Uh, and, and the reason being, there's no other place in Scripture where he says that Peter saw him in the order that I'm going to give you, other than with the 12. And if he was seen by Cephas, well, okay, where, when? And this is Paul. Do you think Paul knew who Peter was? Do you think, do you think Peter would testify to Paul when I saw him? Because, you know, Paul saw the Lord, right, after the ascension. And I'm sure Peter wanted to know, well, you know, tell me about it. You know, like what happened? It was, well, I couldn't see. And I was blind and fell off my horse. And he goes, told me he was the Lord. And, you know, probably, and, and, you know, Peter, he, Paul had to hear all the testimonies Peter had about the fishing and all the rest, uh, you know, after his resurrection. And, and so I find that stuff exciting. You know, other people have seen the Lord. I mean, really. And he was conscious of it. After that, he was seen by over 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remained at present, but some have fallen asleep or died. And after that, he was seen by James, then by uh, the apostles. Now, James is the brother of Jesus. And um, that's probably why he was the head of the church. You know, when we get to Acts chapter 15. He goes, then last of all, he was seen by me also as by one born out of time, meaning that he was seen, uh, uh, you know, after, you know, the ascension. Then, the, uh, for I am the last, uh, least of the apostles who am not worthy to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace, let me say grace, grace. by the grace of God, I am what I am. Popeye didn't invite, invent that. I am what I am. Trump didn't invent that line. Amen. Paul said, by the grace of God, I am what I am. I love it. I am what I am. Oh, my God. Ha. Huh. I love it. I am what I am. And his grace toward me was not in vain, but 
I labored more abundantly than they all, yet not I, but the grace of God which labored was within me. Therefore, whether it was I or they, so we preach, so you believe. doesn't matter. We're preaching and people are believing. Yes. You're sowing seed. You are a seed. <laughs> You've been born of incorruptible seed. You know, seeds are no good unless it die. Hello. Right? But if it dies, right. And so this seed that's working in us, that's sprouting, that's germinating, the Christ in us within, you know, the hope of glory, the kingdom of God within us, where Jesus rules, amen, within our own lives, where he's Lord of Lords and King of Kings. All right, I'm going to run through. Is that okay so far? Yeah. All right. I just want to give you these. Or There's 12 appearances of Jesus or 12 occurrences of when uh, he was with people. Some think it's only 10. But uh, I'm just going to go over them. Uh, you can look up the scriptures if you want. Mary Magdalene, appearance number one, John 20, 11 through 17. That Mary was the first, this prostitute that had been delivered from seven demons and was a, a faithful follower of Jesus. That was the first person to see Jesus. Come on. A woman. And a woman of questionable reputation and runs all the way back to tell the apostles. And they think, oh man, you know, she's all, Hoo -hoo, you know. No, God chose a woman. How about Samaria? What happened there in Samaria, the woman at the well? He chose a woman to evangelize. Ladies, who emancipation. Back then, you know, women were like second-class citizens. It was a man's world. You talk about a man's world. It was a man's world. And we can look back now, you know, enjoying the liberty that we have. People like, you know, you, you can't even comprehend that stuff of how that was. But Jesus started all that, you know. <laughs> Christ then you started all that to where women were able to take their rightful place, not only in society, but even in marriage. I mean, not behind, but alongside, you know, came out of the side. That's where it belonged, right? Right there. And uh, I think I can't help it. I think that's awesome. And then appearance number two, the other Mary and Salome. Well, the other Mary is probably Martha. Uh, we know Salome was uh, Mary, the mother of Jesus, his sister. Also, the mother of James and uh, John, right, of Zebedee. She was married to Zebedee, the fisher guy, fisherman, right? So... That's kind of cool. That's you can read in Matthew 28, uh, 9 through 10, and uh, also Mark 16, 1. And that was on Sunday morning, okay? So this is all happening on Sunday morning. Appearance 3, Simon Peter. Jesus notes appearing to Peter on the Sunday of his resurrection. It is true. The Lord has risen and has appeared to Simon. Now, he comes there, and this is where I think it happened on the Emmaus Road, okay? Some think that we know Cloapas was the other disciple. The other one isn't named. Some say it might have been Cloapas' wife. But, um, you know, there, this is where P Peter comes back and says it's true. And then right after that, um, Spirits 4, and this is all on Sunday evening now. Uh, well, let's do the Emmaus Road. Um, two followers of Jesus walking from uh, Jerusalem to Emmaus on the Sabbath. So it was in the evening, and Jesus appears that we do not recognize him until the end of the account. Now that's the thing. Do you recognize Jesus when he's in your midst? Wow. They didn't recognize him. See, it, it's not necessarily where Jesus is going to, you're going to see him face to face, and you know, you're going to see the resurrected. But by the Spirit, we have to know the Lord. By the Spirit. And the Spirit and the Word never contradict one another. The Spirit will confirm the Word. We have to have balance. It's not all about experience. Too much Word, you're going to dry up. That's it. But too much Spirit, you're going to blow up. But if you have the right balance of Word and Spirit, guess what? You're going to go up. Right, right. You're going to grow up. And you're going to go up, okay? So I wanted to put that to you. Parents 5, the apostles. And this is, I, I believe that uh, the appearance to uh, number 3 is Peter coming back, talking to the, uh, you know, on the Emmaus Road, coming back and telling the apostles. 
And it goes this, um, after Jesus appeared uh, to the two men walking to Emmaus, they returned to Jerusalem to tell the apostles. Uh, and while they were there, Jesus appeared to 10 of the apostles, all except Thomas. Thomas wasn't there. And then right beyond that, you know, in John 20, uh, verse 26 and 30, refers to all 11 apostles, but it was a week later uh, at a home in Jerusalem. And they like refers to the next Sunday. Uh, Thomas believes and no longer doubts. But Thomas was the guy who said, man, unless I see the wounds in your hand and your side. And uh, that's where you get this doubting Thomas. But he had, uh, you know, so it was a, a week later. And then um, the next one is uh, he appears to seven uh, apostles. The final chapter of John records seven apostles at night on a fishing trip occurred on the Sea of Galilee um, sometime after Christ's uh, disappearance, uh, maybe 10 days after his resurrection and before his ascension. So sometime in that time frame, you know, what do we do now? You ever have that? You have an experience with God? Well, what do we do now? Peter says, I'm going fishing. He goes, I'm going, I'm going back to what I did. Think about it. Well, you know, he didn't say I'm going to, but that was his job. He didn't know, you know, we didn't know. They had to go out to Galilee to meet. So he goes, well, I'm going fishing. And what? The Lord, you know, appears to them. Have you caught any fish? No. <laughs> Drop the net on the right side of the boat. 153 big fish they catch. And Peter goes, it's the Lord. <laughs> you know, it's the Lord. It reminded them of their other fishing trip in the beginning when the nets broke. This net didn't break. And I mean, you know, Peter sits there, he's like, uh, whoa, and he just dives in. And he goes swimming, it's the Lord. The other guys are hauling the fish, you know. There was seven of them together, it says. But, six, you know, he's gone, man. I thought after him, that's the Lord, bam, I'm gone. You know, the other guys were finishing their job, pulling the fish in, the big ones, you know. Meanwhile, Jesus already had a little fire going, you know. Had some bread on it, had some fish on it. You know, and he goes, he asked them, you have any meat here? And they brought him some of those large fish, and he's feeding them. They, you know, Jesus is eating with them and all this. Resurrected body. What does that look like? Glorified body. Transcends time, walks through the wall, you know, appearing, you know, as, as flesh and blood. And yet, and eating, and yet, gone, you know. It, you know, whatever. I, who knows what this glorified body is going to be like. But... I know one thing, we have an inheritance just like Jesus. Amen. So what he had, I think we're going to get, don't you? Yes. That's my hope anyway. The only thing I have are these kind of scriptures, but that's the good news. Hallelujah. I hope my resurrected body's a little younger than this one now. <laughs> you know, I don't want to come back at 100 years old, you know. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? But, you know, I want my resurrected body to, you know, I'm sure it's full of vitality beyond anything you can imagine. So... Amen. At any rate, so that was wild. And, uh, you know, that's kind of where Peter where uh, Peter gets restored, you know, um, because he had denied, you know, the Lord three times. And he goes, you know, feed my sheep, you know. Do you love me? Feed my sheep. And so that's kind of cool, really. Anyway, going on. The final chapter records this appearance. Um, and the group that was in that boat, Peter, Thomas, Nathaniel, James, and John, the sons of Zebedee, two unnamed apostles, the third time Jesus had appeared to the group. Um, now, in the, third, in the, the eighth one was the apostles of Galilee. Matthew's gospel ends with the risen uh, Jesus meeting the apostles in Galilee. Jesus receives worship from his followers. He also gives the great commission to his followers to tell them to make disciples of all nations. Appearance 9, you ready? 500 people at one time more. Um, and that's 1 Corinthians 15, 6. And uh, I just quoted that uh, to you before in the, the you know, the scripture. Um, and uh, that's, that's powerful. Can you imagine? They're seeking God. They're, going, they're out in Galilee. They're looking for, for Jesus. There's their purpose. And other people are attracted. Well, they're, they're going to go meet Jesus. Let's go see if it's real. And he appeared to 500 people. Oh, he said, Come on. yeah, can you imagine that? I mean, that, you know, and you know, you talk about a revival. Hello. 
You know, and that's why people travel from around the world. Why? Because they're there to see Jesus. Some come for miracles. Some want to see signs and wonders. Some have a need. But I'll tell you what, I'm going tonight to that revival meeting because I want to see Jesus. I want to see the Lord. I want to see him. And boy, I'll tell you what, every time I've been out there, I could sense his presence and sense his presence. I don't know about you, but I need more of that. I'm addicted. I told Nancy the other day, Nancy, I am really addicted to this. I have to have it. I have to have him in my life. I have to have his presence in my life. You know, I know I'm addicted to air too, but, and water, you know, and I need food, but man, come on somebody. See, that gets, has to be your passion. And either it is or it isn't. If it's not there, ask God, Lord, you know, just, just come to him, talk to him, you know, and, and ask him. Um, Cause he wants to meet with you. One way or the other. He wants to abide in you. He wants to live inside you. Hallelujah. So I'm, I don't want to go in there. He doesn't want to live in a dirty house, you know. So <laughs> I don't know what kind of house you've got, but let's make sure it's nice and clean and swept out. You got all the out of you, you know, as much as possible. And, you know, Jesus will come in. If he lives in your house, he's got a little broom. He'll sweep it out for you, you know. Keep out all the bad stuff. It'll keep putting in good stuff, you know. Anyway, um, he appears to James. Now, there's nothing else except Paul recording that Jesus appeared to James okay and we just read that 15 uh, 7 and uh, you know James was the head of the church running the council in Jerusalem in Acts chapter 15 when they were talking about you know uh, the Gentiles coming into the church and you know should they be circumcised shouldn't they so he was the head of that and um, you know I guess Paul heard firsthand the testimony yeah my brother came, I mean, the Lord came, you know. But can you imagine being the, the second oldest, right? Jude was un, younger than James, uh, and they both wrote epistles. But can you imagine having Jesus as an elder brother? Can you imagine that? And actually living with him and knowing what he was like? I don't know about you, but if I was the Lord and my younger brother... Boy, he would never believe because he knew me the way I was. Do you understand what I'm saying? He knew, you know. Of course, he knows I'm born again. But I'm saying, see, these guys, he never sinned. And they never refuted that. Could your, could your siblings, you know, testify that Jesus never sinned? I mean, that you never sinned and you were the perfect? No way. Man. No way. But that, that I, I, I'm sorry. I think about that crazy stuff. I think about that. James, the, he was really a brother. I had the same mother. He was a half-brother, actually. They had different fathers. Yeah. You know, Joseph was James' brother. But Jesus, I mean, but the father, you know, was Jesus' brother. You don't think about that. They had a blended family right off the bat, you know what I mean? Holy smokes. I mean, you know, come on, man. I Shabbat! <laughs> I, I mean, come on. These are the things that the little nuggets and things I look at and I say, yeah, this is real. This isn't a fairy tale. And the Holy Spirit starts bringing this stuff up to life. And I start thinking, I go, whoa, man, that could have been, what a family that must have been, you know? <laughs> you know, he's sitting there working his carpentry with his dad until his, you know, dad probably died, you know, but uh, take care of his family. And the brothers, you know, why don't you just go on down and start showing, you know, everybody doing all these miracles around here. Why don't you, you know, whatever. No, it's not my time yet. You guys, they didn't believe that he was the Christ. They didn't believe any of that. Hallelujah. But guess what? Once they saw him raised from the dead and crucified all around, whoa, 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 things changed around. When they got baptized in the Holy Ghost, they were part of the 120. They were there. They were there. Amazing. Anyway, then after that, the 11 apostles, uh, they were at the uh, Ascension. And uh, that would have been 10 days before Pentecost. And then the last appearance was to Paul. And uh, without going into that, that's when, you know, Paul was on his way to Damascus and had letters persecuting the church. And uh, the Lord appeared to him and he was blinded by the light. So at any rate, how many of you have a testimony about your encounter with God? How many? Put your hand up if you did. You see, you need to have that kind of a testimony a personal experience.
that you know of. I mean it because that's the only, th honestly, the only thing. And I have to go back sometimes. Oh, Lord, I know you saved me. I know it was you that apprehended me. I had nothing. That'll keep you humble, you know, because sometimes you get full of yourself, and that's not a good thing to be full of. Hmm. You know? but, but when you remember how broken you were, how needy you were, how hungry you were, or whatever your situation was, and the Lord came and revealed himself, whether well, it was at a prayer meeting or a Bible meeting. Like me, it was in a, I didn't even have a preacher, didn't even understand the gospel, really. But yet the Lord had mercy on me, a wasted piece of humanity that God said, okay, you know, he called me. And I just felt like, you know, this I'm gonna just show the devil, you know, do you think you had this kid? Uh -uh. He belongs to me. He belongs to me, you can't have can't touch him. So it's been uh, almost 40 years ago, and I'm so thankful, and I remember that. You see, we need to esteem highly who we are in him. We have to have, you know, how many have got a birth certificate? Yeah. Got a birth certificate. You can't go anywhere in the U.S. without a can't get a driver's license, can't go to school, you know. You got to have a birth certificate, right? Well, I've got a birth certificate. I got a birth certificate. It's here in my heart. It's here in my heart, and it goes everywhere with me. It's, it's hidden. You know, how many of you have your birth certificate in a special place? You know, a lockbox somewhere with other important papers. Well, guess what? Your birth certificate of being born again is here locked in your heart. And very rarely do you show your birth certificate to anybody. Very rarely, you know. But every now and then, when somebody's going to question your credentials or how do you know, you go to that birth certificate. <laughs> you know, here's my, and you tell that testimony of how the Lord saved you, delivered you, healed you, forgive, you know, had forgiven you. And that, you know, and I've been walking with them ever since. You know, I get started, you know, telling stories or testimonies and they're never ending. I used to remember listening to Joe Crandall about the revivals and the miracles that he used to see. And I remember uh, other people that were under the tents with the big healing and telling about these things. And it made me hungry. Wait a second. I want to be able to do that. I want to be able to see those kind of miracles. And it, it, it stirred my faith and my desire. You know, you guys will reach people that I'll never be able to reach. You have a sphere of influence mm -hmm. right where God puts you. And if it's not happening, maybe you're in the wrong place. <laughs> I think the wrong place has not so much to do geographically as it has to do with the condition of your heart. So, anyway. Any questions? How many believe that Jesus is alive? Yes. Amen. All right, the biggest thing now, I mean, I didn't even hit on this, but he's coming again. Do you believe it? Yes. If you don't believe that, yes. we are in trouble. And that's what the resurrection is all about. We talked about the napkin. He folded it all up, put it there. That was a sign that he is coming oh, back. Yeah. And I, I look at that and, man, without a resurrection and without a second coming, whew, you know, what, what, you know our, our faith is in vain. So I know that I know, not only by the scripture, but in my heart. And I look forward to his coming. Do you? They say the great and terrible day of the Lord. Well, it's going to be great for believers, but it's going to be pretty terrible for unbelievers. I don't know about you. I want to be, you know, in that. And whether you believe in, you know, a first, second, third resurrection or, um, uh, you know, your pre-trip, post-trip, mid-trip, you know, rapture or whatever. But whatever your faith is in that, I do believe this. He's coming back. And he's coming back for his church, for his bride. And I got to ask you, are you part of that bride? Are you part of that? I got so shook in that dream when I saw this person that didn't finish the race well, you know, didn't finish the race and he had died. And I, I was broken and I started to shudder. I want to finish the race well. When I mean that, it was, you know, I don't want to say backslidden, I don't want to say judge, but it was like, you know, the question mark, you know, on some, was he really saved? 
was he really saying? Well, nobody can answer that but you. Nobody can answer that but you. And you might have fruit and, and all the rest, but it's your testimony and how you confess. But in that, I, I was so broken. I sobbed uncontrollably in that dream. And when I woke up, I had tears all over my face and on my pillow, and I was still crying. And I just said, God, I need your grace to finish the race well. And that should be our prayer. How many want to finish well today? Stand up. If you're with me today, just put your hand on your heart. Amen. If you're watching, Father, we recognize that salvation began with you. And it ends with you. Lord, you know the end from the beginning. And yet, Lord, we want to surrender afresh our hearts to you. And Lord, I'm asking for abundant grace in this place to finish our individual race. That which you prescribed each one, both individually and corporately. Lord, there's tasks that I just don't even think I, I feel up to at times. But Lord, there's something in me that just keeps repeating that scripture over and over. I can do all things through Christ, which strengthens me. That's all things that you ask me to do. And I thank you, God, for that grace right now because it's abundant grace. Hallelujah. Not just saving grace, not just healing grace. Not just provisional, you know, to believe for provision. But God, this gift is all-encompassing of the kingdom. And Lord, we surround ourselves with your amazing grace. We thank you, Lord, that you're here in our midst. We thank you, God, for the Holy Spirit that's alive within us. We thank you, God, for your word and the incorruptible seed that is within each one of us. Father, we are grateful for your angels and the leading of your Holy Spirit yes. to walk in the light, yes. to walk in truth and your righteousness. And Lord, we submit, we surrender. And Lord, we're believing God that you who began a good thing in us, you're going to complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. Lord, that scripture, Philippians 1.6, that he who began a good work within us will perform it. Thank you, You're performing the work, Lord. You're performing the work, not us. You are performing the work within us being conformed into your image. Help us not to hinder your work. Help us to submit to it. I'm going to say this. Nobody likes going to the dentist if there's a little rot in your teeth and you got to get it drilled out or fixed. Hallelujah. And sometimes we don't want to submit, amen, to the work of the Holy Spirit that wants to drill out a little bit of rot in us. Mm -hmm. Lord, I just say for me, if that's you, you can say amen. But Lord, you know, drill out the stuff that needs to go. God, I'll go to that place. I'll submit to it. I'll surrender it. And Father, I'm thankful, God, that you are so good. So, Lord, we just end saying thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. amen. I just got that picture. Some of us are kick, kicking and screaming, I don't want to go. I don't want to go within us because we're fearful. We're fearful, you know. And it's okay to go get a checkup. You know, I don't like going to the doctor, but it's okay to go to get a well checkup. And it's okay if you ask the Lord. It's, it's okay. Man says examine himself. But you know what? I'll examine myself only so far. That's why I got Nancy, because she'll examine me a little deeper. But Father, we're just so grateful. Hallelujah. All right. May the Lord bless you and keep you, make his face shine upon you and give you peace in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Thanks for tuning in. We'll be back Wednesday night, Book of Galatians, starting chapter 5, I believe. And uh, that's very exciting. That's a really good chapter. And uh, join us. We'll be online at 6.30 Wednesday night. God bless you. Thank you.